few moments. Uh, I see that there are folks that are still entering the room and there's some people whose audio is uh, connecting. So I'm going to wait a few more beats until uh, everyone's in the room and connected with us. While I'm waiting, feel free to put in the chat box where you're joining us from, uh, maybe why you're here or what you're hoping to uh, hear about tonight. And I'll be starting shortly. All right, so it looks like most people have been connected to their audio, so I'm going to start out with our administrative announcements. Thank you for joining us. My name is Amelia. I am a staff member with the New York State Chapter of NASW. I'm quickly going to go over some rules of engagement uh, and pass it off to our facilitators for this evening. Uh, uh, first thing is that we do have closed captioning on. Uh, that closed captioning might be in front of someone's face. At some point, it might be in front of the presentation. You can click and drag and drop the closed captioning anywhere on the screen so you can get that uh, out of something you're trying to view. You can also click the caret next to closed captioning to choose to view the full transcript, which will come up on the right-hand side of your screen, or you can also choose to hide your transcript. I want to thank everyone for being on mute right now. Um, we would like to keep ourselves on mute uh, when a presenter or someone else is talking. When there uh, is time to do question and answer, we definitely want to engage and discuss with you guys. Uh, so that will be the time that you can unmute and speak. Um, if the presenter is talking, feel free to use, again, that chat box, throw in your comments, throw in your questions, and we will reference those when we get to the Q&A section. Uh, I'm going to mention that this is being recorded. Uh, we will look at distributing this after the program for those who aren't able to attend. And lastly, I just also want to mention that this is not a CE program. This is um, a discussion about uh, a report the New York State chapter developed um, on licensing in New York State and some of emerging topics that are impacting the work of that report. Uh, but again, this is not a CE program. I will put our list of upcoming CEs in the chat box after I'm done talking, um, but really want to make sure that everyone knows that this program is not for continuing education. So those are all of my items. Thank you so much for listening to me and hanging in there. And I'm going to pass it over to our executive director, Sam Fletcher. No, I'm not. I'm going to pass it over to our president, uh, Victoria Rizzo, to begin our presentation tonight. Thank you so much. Oh, I get to go first. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Vicki Rizzo. I'm the president of the board of directors of the New York State Chapter of NASW, and I'm so glad that you can be here for what is and it meant to be an informative um, conversation on what's going on with licensing the interstate compact, um, the privilege for 160, Article 163. And so we'll go over each of these really important issues and then um, have a little time for just to answer questions or and also hear your thoughts on, e on each of these issues. Um, so Sam, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Vicki, I think you and Bilia. And most of all, thank you all for joining us tonight. I just wanna start by giving you some background as to why we scheduled this meeting. We actually scheduled this meeting, I wanna say in May. And the reason we scheduled it is because as a chapter, we wrote a report about New York state licensing uh, at the, we, it was done, I'd say in January of this year but we started it a year ago. And the reason we wrote this report uh, was because we were getting a lot of complaints about the licensing process uh, from several of our members and non-members across the state. So we wanted to do a deeper dive into that and see like what's going on, what are the complaints, where are some areas that we can impact licensing in New York to make it easier for social workers. Our intention was we were going to go over this report, let people know where we were, and uh, talk about that more in depth tonight. But there are so many things that have happened since we scheduled this meeting that I'm just briefly going to talk about the report, and then we're going to get into some of these uh, other topics. So uh, I just have to pull up this in front of myself just so I can tell you. When we wrote the report, one of the biggest complaints we were hearing from social workers was about customer service. 
uh, nice said about um, New York State Education Department that they were sending emails or they were calling and they were not getting responses. And there has been, uh, there's been some movement in New York State Ed and uh, different positions have moved around and different hiring has happened. And I have to tell you that our, uh, we, our reports to us about New York State Ed have gone down drastically in the last four to five months. We are getting very, very few complaints. Um, and when we do, we just pass that along to New York State Ed to make sure they know, hey, this is what we're hearing so that they can address it. So now we're actually just referring everyone who emails us or calls us, we're referring them directly to New York State Ed and they are getting back to people in a very timely manner. So that was one of the things that we had addressed in our report. Uh, one of the other things we addressed, and just so you know, we have not written legislation on this yet, and we'll talk about why as we get further into tonight. One of the other things that we wanted to address was that, uh, that in New York State, once you graduate with your master's, you cannot practice until you are licensed. And when we talk about practice, we're talking primarily Can't hear you. Oops, sorry, I apologize about that. Uh, we were, at, sorry, uh, did you hear me talking about that? One of the things we were talking about was that we wanna address is that our new graduates cannot engage in any clinical work until they are licensed, either with a temporary license or their LMSW. And this was problematic because it was taking three to four months for new grads to get their license. And so they were losing job opportunities. So we wanted to make sure, uh, we were like, how can we address this? So we looked at other states, what are they doing? What are other licenses in New York state doing? So one of the things that we're advocating for is that there be a, a period of time where our new grads can practice while they're waiting on their, their license. And we suggested 12 months. That was our suggestion for that. We're also looking at title protection for social work. Uh, licensed master social worker and licensed clinical social worker are both protected in New York State, but social worker isn't protected. So you do not have to have any type of a social work degree to call yourself a social worker in New York State. And we think that should be protected. We think you should have a bachelor's, a master's, or a doctoral degree in social work to call yourself a social worker. Uh, in addition, we were looking at some of the experience requirements for clinical social work and also for the LCSWR and looking at things to make that licensing process a little bit easier. So these are all the things the report uh, contained. I think Amelia put the link in. Um, just so you know that that was the intention. We were going to go over that more in depth tonight, but we are not doing that now because of all the other things that have popped up. So we're going to talk about those things and how it impacts the report that we wrote and our advocacy at New York State. So I am going to hand this back over to Vicki, and we're going to start with the ASWB report and, that came out in August and some of the implications for social work. Thanks, Sam. So the Association for Social Work Boards is the uh, organization that um, develops and administers all of the exams for licensing across the nation for social work. And they released their first report a couple of months ago um, on data regarding first time passage rates and passage rates on all of their um, exams based on um, cer certain demographic characteristics. So just to give you a little background of this in New York State, um, the New York State Association of Deans and Directors began having concerns about bias um, and structural inequities in the exam you know, way back in like 2013, even before that, and actually commissioned a report to be done by the Center for Workforce Studies 
at the University at Albany School of Public Health to, to look at um, this issue. And we did find um, some bias and disparities and we actually met in New York City at Fordham University with some with ASWB who at that time would not entertain uh, releasing data so we could do more reporting um, and it kind of ended there. But since that time, the New York State you know, deans um, talk to the National Associations of Deans and Directors at their meetings about our findings, and um, it just got more esteem and momentum. So what we want you to know today is that there is a report, some of you may have seen it, um, by the association, you know, ASWB, and I just wanted to give you the highlights. I know that um, Sam put in the chat at the very beginning the link where you can go to the website, there they have the highlights of the report. They also have the full report and you can also do queries. Um, you can look at a specific school, you can look at a specific state, you can compare, you know, um, the school reports have like it's compared to the state average of passage rates and, and then the national average passage rates. So just to give you the overview and this has raised lots of um, conversation at the national level among the National Association of Deans and Directors, the Council on Social Work Education, um, and uh, NASW National. And so there have emerged some concerns about the exam. So in looking at the clinical exam, which is the exam you would take for the LCSW, which is the data they reported out right on the front of their website, they looked at data from 2011 to 2021. So the volume of test taking increased, it doubled during that time. So in 2011, there, there were 9,100 test takers. In the year 2021, there were 20,657 test takers. Um, so that speaks to the volume of people taking the exam. During that time, there was also a 14% increase in um, test takers from marginalized groups, Black, Latino, Hispanic um, groups. And 88% of these te test takers eventually passed the exam. So that some of them may have taken it one time. We've heard reports of people taking it eight times. So there's a big um, range in, in the number of times people take this test. So then they also looked at um, passage rates from 2018 to 2021 by certain demographic characteristics. And um, white individuals who take the exam have a 91% passage rate the first time they take it. Um, Asians have an 80% chance, multiracial 87% uh, passage rate. <laughs> Native American, 74%, Hispanic, 77%, and Black, um, 57%. So these are pretty um, concerning passage rates for particular um, demographic, you know, ethnicity and race. Now, the important thing to remember is that these data are all self-reported data. So people can choose to not answer. They can choose to say unknown. And so we, the data, uh, there are limitations to the data that are used for this report. The other place where there were large differences in passage rates were by age. So those who were 18 to 21 years of age had a 91% passage rate. Those who were 50 plus years or older had a 65% passage rate. So showing some discrepancy by, by age as well as by um, ethnicity and race. And those who had English as a primary language had a passage rate of 83%. And those that had English not as their primary language had a passage rate of 70%. Keep in mind that this exam is only offered in English. It only has an English um, version. So th these are some of the um, items that, you know, our major national organizations are concerned about and they're working on. It's going to take time to, um, unpeel the onion, but there are significant concerns that the test is biased in terms of race, in terms of uh, gender, also in terms of um, age, and needing to look at um, 
why that is, they don't really say in the report, you know, they didn't have the data to say, this is why we think this is happening. Um, so that needs to be done. And also there is a movement to um, maybe not have a licensing exam. There's discussions about how we really don't have very good scientific evidence that taking an exam demonstrates that you're competent to be a social worker. There are a couple of states, Rhode Island and Illinois, who have actually gotten rid of the first level of licensing exam, the LMSW. So um, you still are licensed, but it is your bat master's degree. You graduate from an accredited school, and that is your proof that you're ready to be licensed as a, as a first level uh, social worker. So Rhode Island and Illinois have been successful um, with that. And there are ongoing things going on nationally with different organizations about what should be done next in terms of um, responses to the data that was released by ASWB. Um, so now, um, I see that there is a, um, Do you, I, uh, Ray asked a question and then we had a question by Janet. Right. Uh, and then we also have someone about asking about how 18 year olds have a passage rate when they have not even been eligible to take the test. I really don't know the answer to that question. So I was, uh, that's from, from Ray, our great uh, past executive director for New York State. So thank you, Ray, for that question. What I was going to say about that, probably the age range is 18 to something, and there is a BSW exam. Now, New York State does not require the BSW exam, nor do we have licensure at the BSW level, but several other states do. So I'm wondering if it was like... Well, know, there's also the associate exam. So individuals who in some states, you can sit for what's called the associate exam, which does not require you to have a degree in social work at all. So I don't know in those states, if maybe someone can come out of high school, have taken a couple of college courses and, and can take this exam. That, that, but it's a very good question. That's my sort of educated guess on an answer to that question. Thanks, Ray. And then Janet says, uh, okay, so this is, there's a telehealth question that we can get into whenever we talk about interstate compact, because I think it goes more with that. And right. I think we should stick with ASWB right now. Um, but there is a question from Carol, which I think is also a very good one. So the National Association of Deans and Directors, when this report came out, um, initially said that work on the compact should stop because the compact, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, actually is requiring um, the, the licensing exam at BSW, M MSW, and then the clinical levels. And so um, but there was pushback from uh, the folks on the interstate compact committee saying that we can't wait, we have to do this now or it will never happen. So I think there are still some negotiations going on about that, but there's real concern about having the interstate compact and, and states that um, participate in it have to have the, the levels of these exams when we know that they're flawed. And uh, Patricia has a question. Patricia, do you wanna unmute yourself and ask a question? I can't hear Patricia. Can anyone else hear her? No. Okay, let's see. Uh, Patricia, maybe you can put your question in the chat. Uh, for some reason, we aren't able to hear you. Does anyone have any other questions or comments they wanna make about the ASWB exam? I just want to respond to what uh, Jana said, Jana said in the chat about not having an exam, um, how it could um, make our profession not as competitive. We're not saying that there wouldn't be any exam, but it would be for the clinical license. There's great concern 
about the credibility and uh, there would still be licenses. It just wouldn't be attached to an exam at the, at the entry level. And this concern is also um, related to social workers who practice macro social work, um, having the ability to be licensed, but not have to um, take a clinical exam, an exam that has mainly clinical questions on it. I don't know if you wanna to add to that at all, Sam. Uh, no, I'm sorry. I was answering another question. So what <laughs> messaged me? So I, I was answering another question in the, in the chat. Okay. So Stuart said in all the discussion about the ASWB exam and bias, I have not seen any critique about current CSWB curriculum mandates. It would seem that there is a link between what we are teaching students in what is predominantly a Eurocentric curriculum, I think, uh, I, yeah, I think there's a lot of truth to that, Stuart, that like the, if because I know I've heard a lot of our um, colleagues who face racism um, talking about taking the exam and they're like, I have to think like I'm a middle-aged white woman when I take this exam. Like, I can't think about my own culture. I can't think about my practice because the exam is only looking at like this one lens, right? So I think that that has come up. And I do know with the new um, CSWE EPAS that they, that they have added and strengthened the anti-racism component. But Vicki, when does that go into effect? Like in schools for- The which component are you talking about? With the new EPAS, I know that they've added and strengthened, like with the anti-racism. Yes, they have. It's it's in, it um it just passed in 2022. But I think there's an important another important piece to what Stuart is saying, which has been brought up in national conversations, is does the exam match what's being taught in our curriculum? And there is, and all schools are required to measure these nine competencies that the EPAS, now the 2022 EPAS says we have to have, which has nine competencies and standards, but then is the test actually linked to those standards and is it measuring those competencies? If that makes sense. I don't know if that helps answer your question, Stuart. Uh, I think the, uh, some of the competencies are flawed mm -hmm. and that's an issue more than whether it's testing, uh, testing the competencies, but the, um, uh, uh, for, I, I mean, I don't want to take up a lot of time, uh, debating, uh, curriculum, but what, what I would say is that we, in, at least in our human behavior curriculum, which I teach a lot we present a primarily European view of uh, human behavior and human development. Um, and if that's the only thing we're teaching and uh, the exam is, it's obviously leaving out a lot of stuff. Right, thanks. I, I just, I would like to speak up for just one second because I do have experience um, being on the licensing board in Ohio and also being connected with ASWB and the, the exam questions are not generated from the nine competencies. It's not connected to CSWE content. What they do is they survey as many social workers as possible who are currently practicing in the field and they use that data to create exam content. So basically what that does is it's creating a funnel um, you know, of, of who they're surveying. So they have a um, strategic priority this year um, that they'll be reporting out on in November at their delegate assembly about how they are expanding their data collection to be more distributed than, um, than you know, predominantly white females um, and, uh, and I just wanted to say that because I know that's sometimes a point of confusion. Thanks for sharing that, um, Aaron. It's an important point. 
Yes, thank you, Erin. And, and I also see your comment about uh, the bachelor's rate. So the reason we haven't addressed that is because we don't have a bachelor's exam in New York. And again, when we originally scheduled this, it was to talk about other licensing issues we have in New York State. And then we kind of just readjusted it with all of the emerging issues around licensing and um, the interstate compact and everything. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, for, thank you for acknowledging that. And I think what is so disturbing about that is you have to, you know, you have to get to bachelor's to get to master's. So it's holding people out. It's blocking people from entering that master's level to, to get their license. Yes, I think that's probably the case in other states. In New York, it's not the case because you don't have to have a BSW or, and our BSWs aren't licensed at all because most of the social work practice that's written in the law and the regulations will pretty much all of it's at the master level, uh, everything for licensing. Um, and then Danielle, uh, my good friend Danielle uh, was asking about uh, how New York state can require fully licensed LCSW in another state to take an LMSW exam in New York state. They, um, so Danielle, I'm just gonna answer this because it's an easy answer. They don't. So the LCS, your exam right now, the way it stands, and one of the things that Vicki and I also wanted to say, whatever's going to happen with the exam is going to take time because like Vicki set up, this is a national conversation with multiple stakeholders at the table. So we have a lot of people trying to figure out what do we do about this? Okay, so now we see there's a problem. What's the solution to the problem? And it's most likely going to be state to state because every state is so different. So I just wanted to say that. But you, right now, this is the exam, the, the ASWB. So if you took the LCSW and passed that exam in another state, you can get those test results sent to New York State. I did do that, Sam. I got the test results. I got everything. And they wanted me to go back 10 or 15 or 20 years or whatever it is to find people who supervised me way back then. People have died. People have left. People have moved on. And every time I called, it was just like this circle. You know, you never get the same person. And then the answer just, it's just always something like really ridiculous. Like you have to find these people or co-workers that are willing to vouch that you actually did clinical work, which is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. I think that the solution is go to the other state's licensing board who has all of the information, your years of experience, your hours, where you've worked, who supervised you, and just use that along with the, you know, along with your passing score. And that would fix it. It's a great idea, Danielle, and this is one of the things we address in our report is reciprocity between the states for already licensed social workers who have experience. But Danielle, I would reach out again because their response has uh, improved in the last four or five months. It's gotten better and better. So okay. reach out again. Okay, I would definitely will, Sam. Thank you for that. You are very welcome. Good to see you. So I want to answer um, Patricia's question um, about taking the LCSW exam. Um, yes, you can take the LCSW exam in New York, but I, I think you have to have the number of hours, right, Sam? The number of hours and the number of supervision hours and the number of years before you can take that exam. Yes. So if you've been I, practicing in another state, you may run into some of the same issues that Danielle just described. Yes. So it's kind of, let me see if I can find her question. Uh, unless she wants to ask and it. I think, oh, okay. I'm sorry, this is Danielle again, very quickly. I think one of the issues with New York State is they don't understand that licensed clinical social workers don't only do psychotherapy. We do so many other things. Some of us never do psychotherapy. Some of us get our license and do managed care and other things. And the way that it's written is they want you to do, to have the, you know, uh, clinical hours, but clinical hours is not just, or shouldn't just be psychotherapy. And I think that's what the issue is. So uh, Danielle, thank you for adding that. So in New York state, let me clarify, because this goes to Patricia, Patricia's question. It depends where you're located. Uh, Patricia, if you are located in New York State, you have an LMSW in New York State for your LCSW. I don't know what an LISW is in DC. I don't know what the equivalent is. 
So for people from different states on here, every state is different. Every single state has different licensing requirements and different, different uh, levels of licensing. Everything is different about licensing, which is going to come into play when we talk about the interstate compact. <laughs> so I don't know what level that is. But in New York State, LMSWs, they have to be, they're not clinical social workers. L, I, I want to make that very clear because this has also been coming up a lot at the chapter of LMSWs, like opening clinical private practices, which is illegal. You cannot do that. LMSWs are not clinical social workers in New York State. You can train to be a clinical social work in a, an approved setting. It has to be approved by New York State with an approved supervisor. And what New York State is looking for with the LCSW for experience, so some states will have something like three or 4,000 hours of clinical practice, and it includes anything. New York State, it's 2,000 hours, but every hour has to be diagnosis, uh, psychotherapy and assessment based planning. Those are the only hours that count. You can do other things, but those are the only ones that count toward the clinical license are the 2000 hours. So it, it depends on if you, if you live here uh, with that license. Cause if you live in another state and you're trying to go for your LCSW in New York state, it's probably not gonna work. Uh, if you had an LCSW and had full-time work experience for over 10 years, then there's an easier way to get licensed. I hope that that helps. And I wanna, um, Amy just added to Danielle's uh, salient point, which I agree with. I remember I was a CSWR before I was an LCSWR. That's how old I am. And yes, this issue of the uh, supervised hours just being psychotherapy has been an issue since this, um, this became law. And the only way we can change that is through writing legislation to change it because it's written in the law um, that that is the only thing that counts. Um, and so someone else asked, does NASW New York State has a have a stance on this test for it against it? Because lots of other places are coming against it strongly. And I think, you know, as an organization, we want to cut our stance will be what our membership wants our stance to be so that I think you know it's time maybe for us to I don't know Sam have a survey or do something because we're not making any kind of stance decision without input from all of our members mm -hmm. um so yes. we make sure that we're doing what our members want them to want us to do Vicki and I always say we don't make any unilateral decisions with our chapter because we are a member-led chapter. Our members dictate where our stances are and where we are. So it's always done through members and where they stand. Uh, and those of you who know me, I don't like statements. I can't stand writing a statement because really who cares about your statement? What are you going to do, right? Like that's the most important thing is what are you going to do? So it starts with where do our members stand on this exam? That is our first step is what do our members think? Where are they at with this? So that is really our first look at this. Right. And the other thing too is, you know, we are, that doesn't mean we aren't like talking to other really important uh, stakeholders in our state uh, where, you know, have been talking to the New York State Association of Deans and Directors. We have a meeting coming up this Friday where we're, schools are going to be talking about these issues because they have concerns about the test, the interstate compact, um, licensing, because it impacts all of their students as they graduate. We want students to be able to get a job right away, not have to wait to get a license, which for some people, they get it right away. Other people have to take the test more than one time. So. Um, and, you know, we're also involved in the national conversations. And so I think that we do want to know what you think about each of these issues that we're discussing today, because that's going to help us figure out how to move forward. And I do want to just, uh, Ray, we're, your question about the um, New York State license and the interstate compact, we're going to get to that because that's next on our, so I know people have, oh, yes, I also think we do need to, um, talk about the cost of the exam. <laughs> it's one of the major topics nationally. It creates significant barriers for individuals mm -hmm. to get their license. 
It's just one, uh, just another barrier for people. Uh, we want to hear more comments on this, but I know that Sammy will also want to talk a little bit about the interstate compact because I know some of you joined this call to talk about that, which also is, of course, related to licensing and the ASWB exam. Okay, so I'm going to start with a little overview on the interstate compact, uh, and then we'll be able to take some questions on this. So the um, interstate compact started well over a year ago, we may be rounding two years, and it is being led or funded by the Department of Defense in order to help the justification for this is in order to help military spouses be able to be licensed whenever they're moved, whenever their spouse is, is sent to a new duty station in a new state. That's where the whole thing came from. So the Council on Government, uh, it's like CSG, like Council on Governments or something like that. This is the leading organization on writing the compact. It's literally what they do. They write compacts. They're the leading organization. ASWB, NASW, and CSWE are all part of the process. So each of the organizations have people who are contributing to this and have been since the beginning. Writing an interstate compact for social work is much more difficult than other professions. Because remember how I was saying earlier that every single state is different? Not only is every single state different with licensing, we are very far apart, very far apart with licensing. So New York State has some of the highest regulations and laws. New York and California are the most stringent states on licensing. So what the interstate compact does, essentially what an interstate compact is, is it's a piece of legislation. And so you have all of these stakeholders adding to this, their comments on this piece of legislation. We have repeatedly sent out the link to our members to ask them to provide their comments. We think our members and social workers in the state are the best people to comment on this. So we encouraged our members and non-members to read the interstate compact and submit your, your comments on it. So what we know is, I think this is the most commented on compact that CSG has ever had. They've had thousands and thousands of people comment on this, including all of the big organizations. The next phase of this is they have to go through all of those comments and figure out, does it need to be changed? So what they had put up for the commenting path uh, the commenting period, do significant changes need to be made to that? So one of the things like NASW was talking about was what Vicki was saying and the, and the Dean's Association did the same thing is uh, in the way the compact is written right now, the legislation is that people have to pass an exam at every level of licensing. And that's one thing I know that several organizations wanted changed after ASWB released their results to give some room for that. Once you have this piece of legislation, the interstate compact, it cannot change. States have to adopt it as is. So right now we're in the phase where they've, they've shut off comments, no more comments are being accepted, they're going through the comments and they're seeing if major changes need to be made to that legislation. If major changes need to be made to the legislation, it will go back out again for another period of comment that will last a couple of months. If there's not major changes that need to be made, the, then it's ready to send out to the different states. They need seven states to adopt it for it to become an actual compact. Uh, and only the states that adopt it would be in the compact. So now let's talk about New York State. <laughs> New York State has never signed on to a professional compact, ever. And New York State would not be able to sign on to or adopt the legislation from this compact because it directly goes against our, our written laws and regulations. So those laws and regulations would have to change before the state would be able to adopt that. So 
this isn't going to happen anytime soon. And I, I've been very upfront about that with social workers across the state since it came out, uh, just un having an understanding of interstate compacts and how they work. Uh, so one of the questions from earlier, I said, let me answer this when we talk about interstate compact. So someone was asking if they're in another state, can they practice in New York state? Right now, there's an executive order in place because of COVID that allows people who are licensed in another state in good standing, they can practice in New York through telehealth until September 27th. Uh, we don't know if it's going to be extended because the state of emergency in New York State was ended. So that's the last thing we know is that the state of emergency in New York State's been ended. So we have to wait to see if that will that part will be extended or not and allow people to practice. Without an executive order, you cannot practice social work in New York State if you are not licensed here and if you are not physically in the state. You have to be physically in the state and you have to be licensed here in order to practice or you're breaking the law. So I hope that that helps clarify some of that. Now, um, now I'm gonna ask you to put your compact questions in or raise your hand to unmute and ask your questions. So Ray, I do see you put right, uh, recognizing your state. Oh, so Ray, I think I answered your question. I did, okay. All right, Janet, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Yes, um, I had spoken to um, a person at the professional office, professional service office, New York State Ed, about this telehealth uh, uh, interstate uh, waiver process. And I was given the information that if I'm in another state and that state agrees that um, I'm in good standing with um, the rules and regulation, pass the test, I'm an LCSW, I can practice. Um, they would not have any jurisdiction on me practicing um, or providing services to New York State residents. So the, so the professional, the person at, in New York State, PSE um, office said, if that state agrees, then we can see you're not breaking the law and providing services to New York state residents only. Okay, wait, Janet, are you licensed in New York state? I'm licensed in New York state. And do you live in New York state? Uh, no, I'm not living in New York state, but I was told that as long as I'm providing services, to persons in New York State, only in New York State, and the state that I'm living in is, is, has no qualms or no issues with that, then that's perfectly fine. The Office According. of the Professions, this is their area. So if they're giving you that information, they are the governing body of this, right? They're the ones who implement the law and the regulations. Right. And that is something that is in there. Like you have to have permission, like from both states, like uh, right. like to to practice. And some states care, and some states don't care. I think Ray well, wanted to say. Can something I, yeah, earlier. can I say? May sure. I say something about that? I think um, if you are if your chair you're sitting in another state other than New York, and you're licensed in New York. If the other states, if the, the state that you're sitting in um, says you're in good standing and they will accept your New York state license, you can provide services to residents of that state. Um, I don't think you can provide services to, pres to residents of New York state if they are physically sitting in New York state. In other words- No, you that's, that's, the, that's not what I told. Right. I was told, for the state that I'm in, North Carolina, I could not provide care to residents in North Carolina because I was not licensed in North Carolina. My right. license is in New York State. So right. I, as long as as long as the person is in New York State, um, 
professional service and yeah. said, yes, I can yeah. do it as long as North Carolina says it's fine with them. North Carolina yeah. said it's fine with them. They had no jurisdiction. Yeah, I think you have to be physically present in New York State in order to provide the service to New York State residents. Well, that's not what I was told by them. I didn't know if anybody else had any other, yeah. but according to the waiver, it has... Um, that's oh, what the waiver there, there's has been allowed. a waiver for the, uh, and, and Sam, you correct me if I'm wrong, there's been a waiver f- during COVID. I'm yeah. talking about when COVID is over and the waiver yes. is over, that but all I, changes. I heard, yeah, I heard there was an extension to that waiver. That well, that waiver. I don't know. Sam could answer that better. The waiver is in place until next week, the 27th, and we don't know if it'll be extended or not. Okay, so that's the whole issue. It has wait. To yes. Find yeah. out the extension. Okay. And I know that That's Candida, fine. you have your hand up, but I want to just say there was someone else in the chat who asked a question about what happens if you know they're licensed in New York, they have a client in New York, they're treating the client in New York, and then the client moves. <laughs> you, I mean, usually people would refer them to someone in that state. Right. That, I mean that, that that was typic. You know, that's typical social work practice is that, I mean, unless you're, unless you're licensed in that state and you have permission to practice in that state from, from New York state or from that state. Candida, do you want to unmute and ask your question? Well, yes, it was actually a clarifying question for, and I didn't see the person's name that was just asking about being licensed in New York state, but they sit in a different state and can they treat? And I was wondering if that's the difference. If you're not licensed in New York, we can do telehealth, but she, it sounded like you, the person that was speaking is licensed in New York, but they are, they are sitting somewhere else. So I, I wonder if that's the distinction even beyond the, um, beyond the, uh, the waiver that's currently in practice right now. So one way to think about it, thank you, Candida, for asking that, is before COVID, right? <laughs> telehealth was pretty rare. There were, there were people who used telehealth. I know the VA has been using it for years, but it was pretty rare. And in New York State, most services were face-to-face. And so there's been like, temporary telehealth things that have gone through. There's been executive orders that have allowed different kinds of practice and all of that. And as the as we move more into the endemic phase of COVID, some of these things are going to start to change back or change. So that's what we have to keep an eye on. So like, I mean, our, our governor ended our state of emergency. I think it was last week or the week before. So I mean, that could make a play on if she decides to extend this executive order that has allowed people to practice telehealth in our state during the state of emergency. So I think we have a lot of different kind of balls in the air around this and what's gonna actually happen because I think right now we're just starting to see some of the repercussions of how we've been forced to practice over the last few years. Like, uh, I know that, uh, you know, Vicki and I and our team at NASW, we hear from clinical social workers who talk about how telehealth, it's very difficult to tell if someone's in crisis on telehealth versus them being in the room with you. You know, like there's all these things coming into play, like, uh, you know, different supervision, all of this. So yes, Amy, you have your hand up. I, I, I haven't had that experience. I, I'm, I'm, I don't know. I, I'm doing EMDR on telehealth. I, and I, I'm also, and, and it feels to me, and I feel like my clients have, have expressed that, you know, for the most part, other than maybe a few people here and there, that it has been just as effective for them. And, and sometimes I think it, it's availed people more access because they're able to have it be more convenient for them rather than taking two hours out of their day to come up into an office that's you know not that convenient for them. I understand that's not the same for everyone and I get that, 
But I guess I guess it feels like sometimes our profession, and this is just um, if, if you don't mind me ranting just for a moment, it feels like our profession versus psychologists are always the last to get on board with with a lot of the things that are shipped. They've they've had side packed for years. And why is it that we don't? I'm just I'm just saying I understand we have a different profession in some ways, and in some ways we don't. So I, I it's just I, it feels frustrating for me to kind of that we it feels like we're always kind of the last ones at the party you know like the last ones to arrive and i first of all with the with the whole licensing thing about like where if you're doing telehealth my understanding was that you do telehealth where the client sits if you're licensed in the state where the client is a resident then that's what your concern should be i don't remember it even because i've gone to the nset and tried to look to the at their light at their telehealth law and i don't remember reading that i will read it again to see where i missed that that you had to be physically sitting in New York, um, because I just think this is not. I, I think we we ha it feels like we have to move with the times. Like this is, you know, the world has changed. We can't can just go back to everything the way it was. Only I think I think that's just realistic. Thank you. So I can actually address some of that, Amy. So the reason we are different than psychologists is because they psychologists do therapy primarily right that's what they do social workers yes we have a huge group of social workers that do psychotherapy but we have a much more of a generalist practice than uh than the psychologists do and when again you're looking at different states and what is going on in that state with their licensing so my guess is the psychologists, their licenses were much more standard than social work. Ours are not standard. We are very, very different across the states. And that matters because when you're looking to try to get an interstate compact, you have to be much more standardized to get that. And we have the highest regulations and standards, us in California. So it's very hard to go from the highest and bring those standards down. Vicki, did you want to add anything? Um, I, I was going to say that, you know, I, you know, I'm, I'm the intern dean at the University of Albany. I've dealt with, um, I agree that our profession needs to change. I think what happens with uh, licensing and with the regulations around who can treat who, when and where is law. So we have to write legislation to change the law in New York state. And so, you know, we do, Sam, need to um, do some kind of member survey, like how do we want the law to change? Because that's the only way we can change it. And so, um, That's yeah, the only I, way it can change. I mean, that's the way we make the change. And I agree that, yes, it always seems like we're the last one at the party. It took us 10 years to get licensing passed <laughs> when it was passed. Um, so it's going to require a great amount of advocacy and, a co and coalitions. It, it requires schools. It requires students. It requires practitioners, private practitioners, nonprofit um, organization practitioners to make this change. But it does need to happen. I agree. It needs to happen. I also just wanted to add to about like interstate practice. The other thing I think that we have to look at is reimbursement. What's going to happen with reimbursement rates with an interstate compact? Because what I witnessed from insurance companies and reimbursement, it's almost like a race to the bottom. How can we not pay? <laughs> like, how can we not pay social workers? How can we lower the rates? So I think that's another thing that we want our social workers just looking at, like, you know, before, you know, you make your decision on where you stand and like all of that, if that, if that makes sense, it's like, how would that impact? We don't know. That's the answer. And C Candida, you had your hand up. Did you want to ask a, another question? No, it's okay. It was really concerned still with the same, uh, the previous uh, um, question around where you sit um, and that it's, uh, but it's fine. You, you've answered it. I tried to look at it um, online that 
my understanding was that it's where the client sits, not where the practitioner sits. So if I am licensed and I live in North Carolina, but I'm licensed in New York, I can still provide practice to those in New York because it's where the client is sitting, not where the therapist is sitting. And so I think it's, I, I think it's I, both. I, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm almost sure that it's not. And uh, um, just because I've, I've supervised many people and around that specific issue. So I think it's worth clarifying for folk since this keeps coming up um, about that. And that's part of what the reciprocity for many of the people I know who come through are looking at is like they have to, if their client, uh, they have a client, which is happening a lot now with COVID, who was in New York now moving to New Jersey, the therapists here are looking because by our law, our law regulations, we then would have to be uh, licensed in New Jersey. And we could be in New York and still provide services in New Jersey, but we'd have to get the New Jersey license. And I've gotten a few of my supervisees reciprocity in New Jersey um, because of it. And so I, I, I guess I, I just wanted to go back to that because it seemed important to the person who's in North Carolina that I believe what, what state Ed said is exactly how I understood it and how we've been able to maneuver that here. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thank you so much. And I'm actually going to have Amelia put the contact information for New York State Ed in the chat, because what I would suggest is like for any of these questions, because we're not the governing body in New York State and ASW is not, it's New York State Ed and the Office of Professions. And I would, I would refer anyone on this call that if you have any of those like detailed questions to reach out to them and ask for clarification, because I would have it in writing before I, I practiced as to, to make sure I'm not breaking the law in any way. So Sam, absolutely. I just want to, oh, sorry, Candina, go ahead. No, I just said, yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you so much for your expertise too. We really appreciate it. So Karen wrote in the chat, if we all agree that things, uh, the regulations, the laws need to change, what is our plan to move this forward? Um, and that is the, the $60,000 question. And we, um, I think we need to get a survey out. I know that we're talking with um, the New York deans. We're talking with about how we can move forward as a coalition. Um, and it is the, you know, the reason I ran as the president uh, for NASW is around this particular issue, because it is so important that we move our profession forward as quickly as we can, even given the way the legislature works in New York State. Um, so yes, our well, we made some good headroads with um, different um, legislators. I talked to my government relations person at the university. We're trying to think about how can the university centers be involved in moving this forward since they all have schools of social work as well as other schools in the state. Uh, so I, yes, I thank you for that, Vicki. And I, uh, we kind of started this meeting with talking about how we've written this report and we'd identified all these issues with licensing that we think could be updated to make the licensing process easier for New Yorkers. Because I, I saw a few comments in the chat. I can't quite keep up with the chat, but I saw a few saying, oh, wow, there's a lot of regulations in New York State. This is, it's cumbersome and all of that. Yes, we agree. So that's where this started a year ago. Is there like, how can we make this process easier for social workers to get licensed and cut through some of this red tape at the state? This is where everything started with us. And then we just have these additional things that have kind of been added to it. And we had great success with our report last year during the legislative session. We met with the governor's office. We met with several legislators, several who were agreeing with our report saying, yes, we're interested in writing legislation about this, but we've put a hold on it because of all these other things that are happening because it's smarter to write legislation and kind of include everything in it when you write it 
so that you're like you're going you're looking to change laws and regulations you need to do that all at once so the different things we're looking at are the exam uh the aswb exam and uh one of the other things that comes in place so again this is for new york state because i do know we have people from other states joining us tonight but this does come into play with where we go with the changes we want to see in New York State, social workers are called Article 154. That's the way we're written in the laws. And then there's Article 163s. And that includes marriage and uh, family therapists, mental health counselors, psycho and psychoanalysts. Uh, and these professions for the last several years have been trying to earn the right to diagnose. And they have had legislation up for years trying to earn this right. I came to NASW in 2019, and I felt very strongly that it's not our job as social workers to police other professions. However, we can ask that the standards that are set by clinical social workers in New York be the same for other uh, practitioners who are, are wanting to diagnose. That's something we can do is to hold the standard for the public that this is, if someone's diagnosing you, they've, had, they've met all these requirements. Vicki and I and our policy team actually worked with the mental health counselors uh, on writing this legislation last year. We were advocating for social workers during this process saying, look, this is what clinical social workers have to do to be able to diagnose. We think that these things should be the same for the 163 professions. And we had gotten to a point of legislation. We were like, okay, they're there. They have, they have met the same requirements of LCSWs. Now what happened was like three days before the session ended, that is not the legislation that was put through and eventually passed and signed by the governor. So the article 163s now have the right to diagnose in New York and their requirements are very different than social workers. And New York State Office of Professions is working on writing the regulations about how what was written in the law will actually be like what those requirements will be through regulations. Vicki and I have been a part of those conversations. Uh, we have submitted uh, comments to the Office of Professions about what we think needs to change in that. And now we're waiting because the regulations are most likely gonna be written this fall. And depending on some of those regulations, we need to address it for our clinical social workers because we don't think that it should be harder for a clinical social worker to have the right to diagnose than it is for a similar profession like the Article 163 professions. So that's the other thing that is in our orbit right now that we're looking at with what needs to change with social workers. Uh, yeah. Did I miss yeah. anything, Vicki? I, I think, yeah, I think, and what, so why the regulations for the 163s is so important for how we write our legislation is we have to see what their requirements are and ours should not be more stringent than theirs. Like, for example, they don't have a first level of examination, correct? Right now, Sam? Um, right now, yeah. Right, right so, now, we're not quite sure. We're, we're not, not quite sure, sure but we have, to, the important thing is that when we write the legislation that we know what's going on there too. So that when we write the legislation, we have everything in there that is gonna make our profession competitive. We don't wanna come out of this um, with us being at a disadvantage. <laughs> so these are all the things we're looking at when writing legislation, because they, there is a lot that we think needs to change to make this easier for you all. Like, I mean, I know when I was analyzing the laws and regulations, I was like, no one who works full time as a clinician has time to do this. <laughs> like, there's no way you have time to go and understand like every page leads you to another page, to another regulation, to, you know, it just leads you to different things. And so we want to simplify that process, but we, we, we're taking all of these other things into account. And Colleen, I see you have your hand up. Yes, thanks. Thanks ladies for all your work. I know this is not easy stuff and I'm sure you've put in many, many hours. 
Um, so I live in New Jersey. I'm licensed in New York. I'm getting my hours and I can't work in New York or I can't see clients in New York because I'm not physically in New York. And I found this regulation buried in the Office of Mental Health Regulations, like we had talked about, Sam. Yes, and thank so, you, Holly. <laughs> yeah. So my question, though, is you can you can work on the social work regulations all you want, but one this is outside of 163. So you know, uh, unless you're going to go to the Office of Mental Health or whatever other arm there is that you need to go to where there has been legislation written that affects social work legislation, or, or sorry, regulation, then it's it can't change, right? Everything starts with the laws and the regulations, so. Right, but, but I read every word of the New York social work regulation and it says nothing in there about needing to be physically present in New York State. But, Thank you. Thank but, you, because I didn't read that either. Correct, but it's buried in the Office of Mental Health. And that and so we are subject to that. How is that? They're, they're medical doctors, they're psychiatrists, and we are subject to their regulation. So there needs to be like a, a reorg of how uh, social workers can regulate themselves, basically, and not be subject to the regulations of psychiatrists. Thank you, Colleen. And you're right. Like that is, so yes, that's the work that we've been doing is like trying to unweave all of this woven together. And thank you so much. I know we we worked together last month on this to try to, to find all of this. And get you the information you needed in New Jersey. I do want to address a question from Karen in the chat because I think it's really important. Uh, she asked, can anyone recommend a supervisor to supervise me to go from LMSW to LCSW? This is very important. We have had, and, and, and Mary Lynn, I'm going to call on you next, so don't think I forgot you over there. Uh, this is extremely important because we are getting a lot of calls about this and emails about um, LMSWs in New York State practicing out of scope. In New York State, if you are an LMSW, you have to be employed in a setting that is approved by New York State Education Department Office of the Professions uh, to do that they're able to provide clinical services. Your supervisor must be employed by your place of employment. They must be employed by the place of employment. You cannot hire your own supervisor or get an outside supervisor. The, your, the only supervisors allowed in New York State are LCSW, LCSWR, licensed psychologist, or board certified psychiatrist. Uh, they must be employed by the employer and they are they are actually professionally and legally responsible for the clients of LMSWs because LMSWs are not clinical social workers. So Karen, you would have to, it, it, you would, it would have to be wherever you're employed providing clinical, uh, clinical services, they have to provide the supervisor for you. You can't pay someone. Uh, Mary Lynn, do you wanna ask your question? Yes, I do. This is this is so much information. My first meeting attending with you ladies. I mean, it's overwhelming. It's a lot. We're so and glad I you're here. I appreciate it. I'm a LCSW in um, New York City, New York State. And um, two questions. No, one. Well, one question was regarding the supervision. Now, is there, do you have, in order to supervise, the same question as the previous person asked, in order to supervise an LMSW, do you need like a certification for that or how does that work? Because I was you curious about that. You do not. You just have to be an LCSW, LCSWR, licensed psychologist or board certified psychiatrist. Now, LCSWs and LCSWRs, you cannot supervise more than five supervisees. Uh, that's also written, written in the laws and regulations. Uh, and again, something that, you know, there's a lot, there's a lot of laws, there's a lot of regulations. So these, these things get buried in there. And sometimes, you know, it's easy to forget. So you can only supervise five because again, you are legally and professionally responsible for the clients, not the five per year. Yeah. Five, five per at year? any given time. Any given time, you can only have five supervisees. Wait, is there a duration of time or for the lifetime of your license? 
No, five at any given time. So like if you have, if you're supervising five and you have one go off, you could take a new one. Oh, okay. But then, like you said, it's not like somebody can call me and be like, hey, can you supervise me? And they don't work with me. I can't do right. that, right? Nope. No, you so have to. So if be I work employed. at an agency, I have to, they have to be working with me in order for me to supervise them. Oh, wow. That is very good information. I did not know that. Yes. Yeah. You, you have to be. And that's what, that's one reason we wanted to talk, why I wanted to take Karen's question, because again, it's something that you know, there's a lot of laws and regulations and I, and we recognize our social workers don't have time. If you're working, you don't have time to read all of that or find all of these. So yeah, the setting has to be approved by New York state. The supervisor has to be employed by the, um, by the organization or agency. Okay. And the other question is like, that was confusing. Was that it, if, if I have my, my license in New York, I, I have to live in New York and practice in New York. I can't live in New Jersey and practice in New York. Can I? Well, are you practicing in person in New York? In person. Yeah, you can live in New Jersey. If you're licensed in New York and you're practicing in New York, I, it doesn't really matter where you live. <laughs> oh, oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, like I thought, if, I, okay. Because that okay. New Jersey, Connecticut, New York City, I know a lot of times someone will live in Connecticut or New Jersey, but their office is in New York City and their license is in New, in New York. And that's fine. Yes, that's fine. Oh, okay, great. Okay, that cleared that so up. Thank I you have so much, another... ladies. Oh, sorry. No, thank you. Thank you so I, much, I, ladies. You are I have welcome. another question in the chat kind of related to this. So Kamara is asking, that uh, saying, I currently work at a law firm as a forensic social worker, and I'm told you, we cannot receive LCSW hours because we are a law firm. I, uh, do you know anything about this? Um, I well, don't, maybe you do, <laughs> um, the, Sam, but I think it's absolutely, I'll, I'll just tell you that as a social worker who's always worn, worked on interdisciplinary teams in multiple settings, that it seems like the reason why you would have a social worker in a law firm would be to do the kind of LCSW hours. Um, but I don't know if you know anything about this, Sam, these kinds it, of these settings. It depends. <laughs> Is the setting approved by New York State Ed as a place to provide clinical services? A lot of people who work in law, for, law firms are not providing clinical services. They're doing more like um, they're writing biopsychosocials, but they are not doing diagnosis, psychotherapy, and uh, assessment-based treatment planning. That's what qualifies for the clinical license. That's what qualifies as practice. So it would depend. The, um, the law firm would have to be approved as a setting, and the social worker would have to be providing clinical services, the definition I just gave and have appropriate supervision. That's all those things would have to happen. And I see Karen, um, another Karen asked about supervision requirements for people seeking the R. Those are different, Karen. Those are, I think you can actually even hire a supervisor for that. I, I don't know that as well because we just don't get as many questions, but the one thing I do know is that it's different. It's different than trying to get your C, getting your R. So you were right about that. I think A Patel has had hand has been Hi. up for a while. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Thanks. I just want to go back to the uh, to your statement about not having more more than five supervisees. So I'm an LCSWR and I work in a um, approved setting, um, outpatient psychiatry, and I have nine supervisees. Is that not allowed? I would check with New York State. I would email Amelia, put the information, but it says in it says in the regulations and law, what I have read is that you can you can't have more than five. Uh, okay. I might even be able to pull that up. That would be very helpful. Um, yeah. I'm just thinking of myself and the other supervisor who also has, I think, 10 supervisees, um, which is 
I don't know, voluminous to say the least in terms of the clinical and administrative tasks. But um, if there's something that specifically states that it can't be more than five, I would love to see that in writing. Okay, I'm looking to see if I can pull it up. And while you're pulling that up, uh, Laura Eastman Follis asked you, um, are you providing all this supervision to um, people that are working toward their LCSW hours? Oh, great question from Laura. This is different from having a department that you supervise. Like if they're working towards different levels of licensure, like maybe some are licensed mental health, are they all social workers? Are some licensed mental health counselors? Are some of them just starting out, they're not working toward their LCSW yet? Okay. If we want to, if you want to take some more questions, I will kind of keep looking for this. So does anyone have more questions? Did I think the person, answered... did the person who asked the question reply who the, what kind of worker she was supervising? That would be helpful. Yeah, oh, um, A Patel, what sure. are they? Sure. Uh, yeah, so I'm super, I'm in outpatient psychiatry. So I'm supervising, um, I would of the nine, let's say seven for their seven LMSWs for their LCSW hours and then two LCSWs for their R hours. But can I just ask where, where, like in what, do, I mean, I can search for it on my own. Is it like in OMH regs? Is it in the, is it in the licensing regs? licensing the law and the regulations i'm not quite sure if it's the law or the regulations so i'm in both right now again it takes like forever to find anything in here sure. um, i just know where to look rather quickly uh so i'm still seeing if i can find it very quickly Oh, sometimes it's in the commissioner's regulations too. Mm -hmm. So everything, let me tell you all this. Everything is listed. There's four places. There's education law, insurance law, the regulations of the commissioner and the board of regents regulations. But Sam, wouldn't the office of professions be able to answer that question? Yes, they would. Okay. They would be able to answer that. So that's where you could easily go to find out that information without having to read through and sort through all the laws and regulations. That's what I would do. Yes, thank you, Cheryl. Okay, I'm not able to find that quickly. So yes, PJ, I uh, keep or try to email. Um, we had said at the beginning that um, what the reason we started all of this work is because of the number of complaints that we were getting about people not getting responses from New York State Ed or Office of Professions. And our level of complaints has gone down drastically in the last four or five months. So I know that they put some things in place to try to be more responsive to social workers in the state. So I would suggest reaching out again and asking your question and see if you can get, get a response. Again, if you have something in writing from New York State Ed or the Office <coughs> of Questions, that's your answer. If, I mean, that, that is the regulating body. I also wanted to thank uh, Nancy Smith. I saw she had put a link in earlier in the chat. I wanted to thank her for doing that. That provided more information. Okay. 
I'm just seeing any other questions about anything that we've talked about. We have about 10 minutes left. I have a quick question and that's on a behalf of a colleague of mine who lives in New Jersey. She took her exam, her LCSW and her hours, she was working in New York City at that time and she couldn't, like, she's having a hard time finding somebody to, to sign up for hours, which, what can she do? But she took her test and passed, but it was just an, an issue with her hours now. This is one of the things we actually addressed in our report about licensing is because we were getting a lot of this either a supervisor refused to sign off or they couldn't find them. So they had left or, so there's one, there is uh, a caveat that's listed in all of this that like, if, uh, if your supervisor has died, you can ask for a colleague to sign essentially a document attesting to the fact that you'd work the hours. Uh, so that's one of the caveats there are, but that's one of the things we were advocating for that, like, if someone could not find people, this is, Danielle had mentioned this earlier, and I know this is one of the issues she had, because she'd been practicing for 20 years, she couldn't find her former supervisors to get the clinical license in New York State, and one of the things we were advocating for, and again, this would have to go through the legislation, have to be approved as law, but we would love to be able to see social workers in this position be able to take their case to the state board and have their peers decide that if they've met the requirements uh, of this, because we do have a state board and it would be great if, if you know, we could use them in that way that with these special circumstances, it's not every social worker, but there are some that they just cannot find the supervisor who supervised them or again, We've had a few that they just refuse to sign off on it, that there, there's got to be recourse for them. So we agree with you on that. But right now, the only thing is um, if they've died, possibly if they can't find them that you'd have to check with the office that a peer can attest that worked with them. I hope that helps. And Amy, I think you wanted to add something too. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of just struck about this whole residency requirement for New York State when it's not anywhere on the OP's website, because I remember looking at that specifically and other, you know, I recently became licensed in Maryland because I had a client move who wanted to continue working with me via telehealth. So I did that for her. And they're very clear. They have, and like, I'm not saying they're great, but they have like a FAQ of like, can you do this? Can you do that? No, you can, or yes, you can, or this is that. And in ours, it's like a morass. It's very hard to read it. It's, you know, uh, and I appreciate all that you all are doing. I'm, I'm, I'm a NYC chapter member because I live in New York City, but like here, think about how ridiculous it is to ask somebody who's licensed in the state of New York to actually then be required to live there to do telehealth with someone What's the difference if, if someone lives in Jersey and is doing some, uh, you know, licensed in, in New York and would, let's say, theoretically be able to do telehealth, what's the difference between that, like, say, if they live in Jersey City and somebody's, you know, in, in New York City, who cares, it's big, but like, what's the difference, I'm seeing someone in Buffalo via telehealth, I, I don't live in Buffalo, we have Google, we don't need to know, like, it, that's an old fashioned view, I think, of our profession of like, you need to know all the resources in that community. You know, I don't know all the resources in Buffalo, but if I had to, I could find out if there's an emergency or something like that. Like, I mean, it's just, I'm sorry. I'm, thank you for listening to me rant. It's just very frustrating, the whole thing. Amy, you sound like me last year when I started going through the regulations and I would, I would meet with Vicki and our, our past president, Michael, and I'd be like, did you all have any idea of this? Because I mean, Vicki's been a social worker for over 30 years. She's like, I had no idea. I've been a social worker for 30 years. I'm like, how can any of our members find this? Like, how can they, like, I, I mean, I'm putting time. I put months. It took me like three or four months to write this report with help. We had Vicki helped, our other president, our outgoing president helped. We had two members. Lauren's on this call. Lauren, say hi, if you're still on <laughs> And another, another clinical social worker that both really helped us and gathered stories from the social workers and everything. It was, 
very helpful. So I, I hear your pain and I felt the same way. And so part of what I was putting together as I was doing this is, oh, so the, there were lobbyists, I suspect probably from psychiatrists and psychologists who were trying to keep social workers from getting the right to diagnose. So all of these things had to be put in place for us to get that right. That is what I kind of put together because I was like some, I was like some of it, I was like, this makes no sense. Why would this be in the law? Like, I, I don't need, I'm like, I don't even understand the purpose and who thought this up. That was, those were the kinds of conversations we were having last year over this. And then it was like, and then I was talking to, we have some members who've been members since like, you know, the 1960s. And I was talking to a few of them and they were explaining, oh, we were trying to get our right to diagnose. These were the things that were happening. And so then I was like, okay, that makes a little bit more sense to me as to why these are there, but I don't know that they should be there still, right? Like this was 20 years ago. Now we're in a different place. And I think Vicki, you had even said when you came in, you were like, this is based on what, what did you say about how social work was different 20 years ago? Something with competency-based social work versus- All right, versus uh, learning objectives. Huh. Yeah. Like, so Vicki's like the whole profession has changed in 20 years. So like none of this really aligns with the way that we're practicing now. So these are all conversations we had and those frustrations were there. Well, and I, I think in terms of what you're saying about the interstate compact, it also sounds like based on where New York is now legally, that none of us will be able to participate in that actually. And that I find extremely frustrating Additionally, for anybody trying to be slightly more mobile or God forbid, the social worker themselves want to have a slightly different quality of life, you know, and how that plays out with everyone's individual. I know for my, I'm trying to plan around trying to keep my, you know, keep my practice and deal with aging parents out of state. And I thought I was going to be able to do that. And now I realize as of this meeting tonight, I'm not going to be able to so easily do that legally. So I'm going to have to figure out some other way. And it's really frustrating because it's like ridiculous ridiculous i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> no it's totally it's okay <laughs> we, thank we you. Hear you and that is our job we're trying to make this easier for new york state and now i hope that you all have a better understanding of all the balls that we're looking at before we go to write legislation because we what we don't want is to leave something out right <laughs> like something that's like oh man we just you know we're, you know, we see the need for this and we left a major part of that out. So that's, we're very carefully kind of going through, looking at this from all angles before we sit down and like, here's what we've got to get through. Vicki, did you want to add anything? We're about uh, 7.28. No, I think this was a great conversation. I really, we really value all of your comments and thoughts and questions. Um, and concerns, you know, we have a lot of work to do. We do, and we will keep working, and we really appreciate all of you, and we appreciate the work you do every day uh, in working with our communities, and uh, we will definitely have more meetings on this. That was kind of the plan, is that we'll just schedule periodic meetings on licensing, because we know that this is a, a topic in New York, and that we need to be available to answer those questions. So be on the lookout and we really, really appreciate you all joining us. And thank you, Laura, it's very nice. Nice seeing some of our, our friends we haven't seen in a, in a while here. All right, I'm gonna stop our recording.